Hi everybody, welcome to another story time with Sid. It is me, Sydney of Hightower, as it is every week, and here we are again with another story. Now, we are continuing our journey into this book called The Wind in the Willows, Toad's Adventures. This is going to be a little bit different from the rest of the stories that I've read, mainly because I'm going to just be reading a few pages of a continuous story. Think of your parent, maybe, reading stories, or your grandparent, or whoever took care of you growing up, reading stories to you before bed. This is kind of what I want to elicit with this story. So, let's get started. It was a gloomy luncheon for Rat when he had to face Badger and Mole with his pitiful story. The Badger's caustic remarks may be imagined, and even Mole could not help saying, You've been a bit of a duffer this time, Ratty. Toad did it awfully well, said the crestfallen Rat. How did you? Awfully well, rejoined the badger hotly. One comfort is we're free now, and he needn't waste any more of our precious time doing sentry go. But we'd better continue to sleep at Toad Hall for a while longer. Toad may be brought back at any moment on a stretcher, or between two policemen. Meanwhile, Toad, gay and irresponsible, was walking briskly along the high road, some miles from home. Feeling safe from recapture, he almost danced along the road in his satisfaction and conceit. Smart piece of work, that, he remarked to himself, chuckling. Poor old Ratty. Won't he catch it when, he, when the badger gets back? He strode along till he reached a little town where the sign of the Red Lion reminded him that he had not had breakfast that day. He marched into the inn, ordered the best luncheon, and sat down to eat it in the coffee room. He was about halfway through his meal when an only too familiar sound made him start and fall, a trembling all over. The poop-poop drew nearer and nearer. The car could be heard to turn into the inn yard and come to a stop, and Toad had to hold on to the leg of the table to conceal his overmastering emotion. When the group, hungry, talkative, and gay, entered the coffee room, Toad listened all ears. At last he could stand it no longer. He slipped out of the room quietly. There cannot be any harm, he said to himself, in only just looking at it. The car stood in the middle of the yard, quite unattended. Toad walked slowly around it, inspecting, criticizing, musing deeply. I wonder, he said to himself presently, if this sort of car starts easily. Next mom no moment, hardly knowing how it came about, he found he had the hold of the handle and was turning it. The old passion seized on Toad and completely mastered him. As if in a dream, he found himself seated in the driver's seat. As if in a dream, he pulled the lever. All sense of right and wrong seemed suspended. He increased his pace, and as the car devoured the street and leapt forth on the high road through the open country, he was only conscious that he was Toad once more, Toad at his best and highest, Toad the terror, the traffic queller, before whom all must give way or be smitten into nothingness and everlasting night. <sighs> to my mind, observed the chairman of bench magistrates cheerfully, the only difficulty that prevents itself is how we can possibly make it sufficiently hot for the incorrigible rogue and hardened ruffian whom we see cowering in the dock before us. He has been found guilty, first, of stealing a valuable motor car, secondly, of driving to the public danger, and thirdly, of gross impertinence to the rural police. Mr. Clerk, what is the stiffest penalty for each? The clerk scratched his nose with his pen. Supposing twelve months of the theft, which is mild, and three years for the furious driving, which is lenient, and fifteen years for the cheek, which was pretty bad sort of cheek. Judging by what we've heard, that adds up to nineteen years. Make it twenty to be on the safe side. An excellent suggestion, said the chairman approvingly. Prisoner, try to stand up straight. It's going to be twenty years this time. And mind, if you appear before us again, we shall have to deal with you very seriously. Then, the brutal minions of the law fell upon the hapless toad, loaded him with chains, and dragged him from the courthouse, shrieking, praying, protesting across the marketplace, where the playful populace assailed him with jeers, carrots, and popular catchwords, across the hollow-sounding drawbridge below the spiky portcullis, past guard rooms full of grinning soldiery off-duty, past sentries who coughed in a horrid, sarcastic way, across courtyards where mastiffs strained their leash past the rock chamber and the thumbscrew room. 
The rusty key creaked on the lock. The great door clanged behind them, and Toad was a helpless prisoner in the remotest dungeon of the best-guarded keep, the stoutest castle in all length and breadth of Merry England. When Toad found himself immured in a dank and noisome dungeon, he flung himself at full length on the floor and shed bitter tears, and abandoned himself to dark despair. This is the end of everything, he said, at least of the career of Toad, which is the same thing, the popular and handsome Toad, the Toad so free and careless and debonair, stupid animal that I was not to listen to the wise, wise old badger, clever, intelligent rat, or sensible mole. Thus he passed several weeks refusing his meals through the grim and ancient jailer, knowing that Toad's pockets were well lined, frequently pointed out that many comforts and indeed luxuries could be sent in at a price from outside. Now the jailer had a daughter, a pleasant wench and good-hearted who assisted her father. Pitying the misery of Toad, she said to her father one day, Father, I can't bear to see that poor beast so unhappy and getting so thin. Let me have a managing of him. You know how fond of animals I am. I'll make him eat from my hand and sit up and do all sorts of things. That day she knocked on the door of Toad's cell. Do try and eat a bit of dinner, she said. See, I've brought you some of mine, hot from the oven. It was bubble and squeak, beef and cabbage, and while Toad refused to be comforted, the penetrating smell reached Toad's nose and gave him the idea that perhaps life was not such a blank and desperate thing as he imagined. When the girl returned some hours later, she carried a tray with a cup of fragrant tea steaming on it, and a plate piled up with very hot buttered toast, cut thick, very brown on both sides, with the butter running through the holes, and in it great golden drops like honey from the honeycomb. The smell of that buttered toast talked to Toad of warm kitchens, of breakfasts on bright frosty mornings, of cozy parlor firesides on winter evenings. This time, he dried his eyes, sipped his tea and munched his toast, and soon began talking freely about himself. The jailer's daughter encouraged him. Tell me about Toad Hall, she said. Toad Hall, said Toad proudly, is an eligible self-contained gentleman's residence with up-to-date sanitation, large banqueting hall, a good comfortable place, not like the outside world, the Wildwood, where stoats, weasels, foxes, and other wild animals lived. Bless the animal, said the girl laughing. I don't want to rent it. When she said good night, Toad was very much the same sanguine, self-satisfied animal that he had been of old. He sang a little song or two of the sort he used to sing at his dinner parties, curled himself up on the straw, and had an excellent night's rest and the pleasantest of dreams. In his vanity, he thought that the interest of the jailer's daughter proceeded from a growing tenderness, and he could not help half regretting that his social gulf between them was so very wide, for she was a comely lass, and evidently admired him very much. One morning, the girl was very thoughtful. Toad, she said presently, just listen, please. I have an aunt who's a washerwoman. There, there, said Toad graciously and affably. Never mind, I've never, I've several aunts who ought to be washerwomen. As I said, my aunt is a washerwoman and does the washing for all the prisoners in this castle, taking it out on Monday morning and bringing it in, it in on Friday evening. This is Thursday. You're very rich and she's very poor. Now, if she were properly approached, squared, I believe, is a word you animals use, you could come to some arrangement by which she would let you have her dress and bonnet, and you could escape from the castle as the official washerwoman. You're very alike in many respects, particularly about the figure. We're not, said Toad in a huff. I have a very elegant figure for what I am. So has my aunt, replied the girl, for what she is. You surely wouldn't have Mr. Toad, a Toad Hall, going about the country disguised as a washerwoman. Then you can stop here as Toad, replied the girl with much spirit, and the Toad had to admit the girl was right. Next evening, the girl ushered her aunt into Toad's cell, bearing his week's washing. The old lady had been prepared beforehand, and the sight of a certain golden sovereigns that Toad had thoughtfully placed on the table left little further to discuss. Toad received a cotton print gown, an apron, a shawl, a rusty black bonnet, the only stipulation the old lady made being that she should be gagged and bound in a corner in order to retain her situation in spite of the suspicious appearance of things. Toad was delighted with the suggestion. It would enable him to leave the prison in some style, 
and with his reputation for being a desperate fellow untarnished, and he readily helped the jailer's daughter tie up her aunt gently. Then, shaking with laughter, the girl proceeded to hook and eye him into the cotton print gown, arrange the shawl with a professional fold, and tie the strings of the rusty bonnet under his chin. You're the very image of her, she giggled. Only I'm sure you never looked half so respectful in all your life before. Now goodbye, Toad, and good luck. If anyone says anything to you, as they probably will, being but men, you can chaff back a bit, but remember, you're a widow woman, quite alone in the world, with a character to lose. With a quaking heart but as firm footstep as he could command, Toad set forth cautiously on what seemed to be a most hare-brained and hazardous undertaking, but he was soon agreeably surprised to find how easy everything it was made for him, and a little humbled at the thought that both his popularity and the gender that seemed to inspire it were really another's. The chaff and the humorous sallies to which he was subjected formed his chief danger, for Toad was an animal with a strong sense of his own dignity, and the chaff was mostly, he thought, poor and clumsy, and the humor of the sallies entirely lacking. However, he kept his temper, though with great difficulty, and did his best not to overstep the limits of his good taste. It seemed hours before he crossed the last courtyard and dodged the outspread arms of the last warder, pleading with stimulated passion for just one farewell embrace. But at last he heard the wicket gate and the great outer door click behind him, felt the fresh air of the outer world upon his anxious brow, and knew that he was free. And that is where we're going to end this section of The Wind in the Willows Toad's Adventures. Interesting. They kind of glossed over a little bit, because of course this is a children's book, um, how Toad was treated differently than when he was dressed as a woman and people thought that he was a woman, um, which is very interesting. Also what's very interesting is that because this book was um, from my friend, um, the, word, the word sex was replaced with gender. <laughs> Because I suppose the person that gave them this book didn't necessarily want them to read the word sex. But the word sex does specifically uh, refer to, um, does specifically refer to gender in that case. Um, but now we're kind of seeing that the more we progress, the more sex and gender are sort of wishy-washy anyway. So, it's actually, it was just very interesting when I read that. I was like, oh, they crossed out the word sex. Um which is fascinating. So, I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope that you'll continue to join me for the rest of this story. Um, I'm really interested to see what the moral is by the end of it, but I can already tell that there's a lot of things for you to parse upon now, just reading just a few pages. So thank you so much for joining me for this chapter, and I hope to see you next week. Please stay happy, healthy, and safe.